um, and uh, inquire about their activities of daily living. So sometimes people can, you know, they might just be breathless if they're exercising, but sometimes they're breathless on sitting or if they're doing day-to-day uh, -day activities, which will reduce the quality of life. You want to quantify the exercise tolerance. So if someone says, I am breathless, you want to say, are you breathless if you take five steps? And is it that you were always breathless when you took five steps or is this something new? Has there been a change from before? So a fit and healthy person would probably say, yeah, I can walk, let's say about, uh, I can walk uphill, only feeling slightly breathless. But someone, let's say, who has heart failure or who might have some respiratory condition might say, if I walk five steps, then I feel breathless. So you want to try and get like a quantitative figure if possible. See if it's gradually improving or worsening. And if so, what is making it better? So usually people will have inhalers if they have respiratory conditions, nebulizers or oxygen at home that might help them. What makes it worse apart from doing activities? Is there anything else? Some key symptoms you want to ask about with this is, uh, do they have a cough? If it's a cough, is it productive? If the cough is productive, you wanna see if it's a white phlegm, if it's green or yellowy, which could indicate an infection. Is there any hemoptysis? Do they have any other sounds, such as a wheeze, uh, any fevers or any chest pain? So if someone does have chest pain or any sort of pain, do you guys know of any mnemonic that uh, we can use to uh, sort of get a pain history? You can either unmute your microphone or just pop it in the chat box. Oh, there we go, Socrates, yeah. So Socrates is what you're gonna do if someone's got pain. Uh, so usually with shortness of breath, you, they might have chest pain, but they can also come in with pain anywhere else. Once you've gone through <clears throat> the main points in the history of presenting a pain, you go to the past history. So the past medical history, you want to particularly see if they have any asthma, COPD, or any cardiac history. Cardiac history, for example, heart failure can cause shortness of breath. See if they've had any previous surgeries. In their drug history, focus on any inhalers, home oxygen or nebulizers, any drug allergies. What's important with drug allergies is that you want to inquire whether they actually have an allergy or if it's an intolerance. And uh, an allergy would be when it gets, uh, when they might get like itching or it might be very severe that could lead to anaphylaxis. But intolerance would be like, I have the tablet and I, I get a bad tummy, but that, that's about it. So that means the medication may not suit them, but they not, may not be allergic. You wanna inquire about family history, especially any A to B. And then lastly, you move on to the social history. So you wanna see, are, are they smoking? If they're smoking, um, ask them politely. Uh, can I ask what you're smoking and how much are you smoking? Uh, alcohol consumption, their occupation. Uh, occupation is particularly important if you're suspecting, let's say lung cancer. <clears throat> May not be very common these days, but exposure to asbestos or any certain diets can increase your risk. Uh, housing. Housing is also more just to inquire about um, the activities of daily living and how they get around things. Um, are they, have they been in contact with an unwell person? So when you ask that, you're sort of thinking, uh, is there some sort of infection? For example, someone's come from like um, a country where TB is more pro popular. So you're thinking, could this be that? Travel history plays in with the unwell person and pets, um, because someone's come in with shortness of breath and let's say they have a history of asthma. Uh, you want to see what triggered the new episode that's made it worse. So could it be that they recently got a pet or were they exposed to any other triggers such as dust or allergies? So you just want to get a sort of a round picture to make sure you have all the information. When it comes to examination, there are, um, so I said basics, because these are things you probably do in all examinations. So you want to do hand hygiene. I said plus minus PPE because when in today's day with COVID, um, if you even go to do an examination on a person who's negative, um, yeah, um, on negative, so you may still want need to wear an apron and gloves. 
uh, sorry, just going back to the history, as Mr. Patacharya mentioned, mentioned, you should also check if they have any history of PE or DVT, because if they've had it once, uh, it's a differential that you want to have on your on top of your head. Right, coming back to examination. So do your hand hygiene, introduce yourself, explain the examination, request the patient to adequately expose their chest. So in a respiratory system examination, this will ideally be if they just remove their shirt, uh, that way you can have a look at their arms and their, and their face and their chest easily. And lie the patient at an angle of 45 degrees. Following that, you want to begin inspecting the surroundings. So can you guys sort of pop in the chat box what uh, things you're gonna be looking for in the surroundings if it's a um, respiratory system examination? Yeah, okay, perfect. So yeah, we get, we're getting the common ones, which is perfect. So you're looking for inhalers, as you guys said, we're looking for oxygen masks or nebulizers, uh, looking for walking aids. Now that doesn't necessarily tie with respiratory, but it ties with the patient and if they're frail and their general well-being, and that would have an effect, uh, impact on any health condition. And you're looking for sputum pots. If you do see a sputum pot in a patient, uh, around a patient, uh, offer to examine the contents inside of it. Uh, if you can, you can just comment, okay, it looks, uh, purulent or it looks yellow, could indicate infection, I would send it for a further analysis. So that way the examiner knows that you are aware there is something that could give you an indication of what's happening. Uh, someone did say scars, yes, scars, but we won't come to that just yet. We'll come to that when we're inspecting the patient. So once you have uh, observed, the, uh, inspected the surroundings, then you want to inspect the patient itself. So there are a few things you want to do when you're inspecting the patient. The first thing you're going to do is observe them from a distance. You're then going to follow on, observe, uh, inspect their hands and arms. You'll inspect their face, their neck and their, to their, neck and their thorax. I, so I do it in this order. You can do it in whichever order you feel comfortable. But in this order, I feel it's easier because once you observe them from a distance, you go, you observe their hands and then you're going all the way up to their face, coming down to the neck, their chest, and then you'll carry on with the examination without having to disrupt the flow. So when you're examining, uh, inspecting the patient, you wanna see, are they comfortable? Is there any cachexia? Are they having any breathing difficulty that you can hear just from observing them? Is there any visible cyanosis? Are they coughing? Uh, some patients might be really unwell, they might be coughing continuously. Uh, are they coughing intermittently? So during an OSCE examination, it's important to say that I'm gonna take a step back uh, and observe the patient and the surroundings. This way the examiner knows that you, um, you are aware enough to have a look at the surroundings and the patient itself in general before focusing on the, you know, the particular bits. So in terms of inspecting the hands and arms, uh, there are three, four key things that you look for in a respiratory system examination. Uh, can anyone think what A is? Just pop in the chat box. Yeah, so as correctly said by I think Scott, A is star staining. And what do you guys think is B? Yeah, cyanosis. Uh, and what about C? Clapping, perfect. Okay, right. Um, <clears throat> I'm just gonna uh, speak a bit about this, but it's in the previous slide, yeah. So when, <clears throat> just coming back to this, when you're inspecting a patient and you're seeing, are there any breathing difficulties? You want to see if there's any, sorry, <coughs> if there's any increased work of breathing and to see if uh, that's happening, you want to see if they're using the accessory muscles of breathing. 
So you would probably see if a person, a healthy person's breathing, you probably won't be seeing increased effort on the chest. But if a, they are increased breathing, then they're using the accessory muscles, yeah. Just keep a lookout for that. Okay. So yeah, as you guys correctly mentioned, tar staining, which can happen if they're a smoker, peripheral cyanosis, and clubbing. There are other things you can look out for, such as muscle wasting or nail discoloration, uh, but the three main things you're looking out for are A, B, and C. Coil and Nikia, you can. Um, it's more commonly done in abdominal examination, but uh, there's no reason why you can't overlap. Also, when you're doing an examination in real life, patients can have multiple problems. So it might be useful to sort of integrate like the findings from a cardiovascular respiratory abdo into one. You can just see if there's any abnormality. Yeah, and you can look at capillary refill time as well. Uh, right, so in terms of inspecting for clubbing, um, that's how you do it. You want to ask the patient to put the index fingers together and you're basically looking for this diamond shaped window to be present. If this is present, that would indicate no clubbing. If, the, if it's not present, that would mean that the patient does have clubbing. Can you guys think of any respiratory causes for clubbing? Yeah, so cystic fibrosis is one of them. Yeah, lung cancer, good. Yeah, COPD could potentially, that's right. Uh, other things are pulmonary fibrosis, bronchiectasis, yep, IPF, that could also cause it. Uh, so there are quite a few things that could cause uh, clubbing. In your exam, you could, so you could mention two, three common things saying, uh, I'm assessing for clubbing as it could indicate this, this, and this. You don't have to say a long list. If you just say a few, at least the examiner will know you are aware of why you're assessing clubbing. Following that, once you've inspected the hands, you've checked for clubbing, you want to check for asterexis. So that is a flapping tremor. What is the most likely cause for asterexis uh, related to the respiratory system? Um, Yep, CO2 retention. Oh, you guys are doing really good. Yeah, so CO2 retention is the most likely cause. In terms of assessing it, you want to ask the patient to place both their hands straight and forward and then clock their wrist back. So stretch your hands outwards, hold them backwards at the wrist joints and you want to observe for 30 seconds. If they don't have any asterisks, they're just going to stand there. They're not going to have any flap. They might move a little because, well, the process of stretching your hands may not be comfortable for everyone, especially if they're elderly, um, but they're not gonna have any flap. If they do have asterixis, so that's how the hand's gonna go. It's gonna be up and then it's gonna drop down, it's gonna come back up and it's gonna keep dropping in those 30 seconds. If that's true, then you can say, yeah, the, there is asterixis in this case, uh, it's intermittent flapping. So, well, you've, so you've had a look at the hands, uh, you've inspected it, you've checked for clubbing, chest for asterixis. Next, um, this is more sort of examining, but I've, I integrated with inspection, just because then you can finish off everything to do with the hands and the arms, and you don't need to come back to it. Uh, so yeah, you want to check the temperature, you want to check the heart rate and the respiratory rate. So for the heart rate, um, you want to feel it for 15 seconds multiplied by four and you get it for the minute and the respiratory rate you want to check it for 30 seconds multiplied by two because as you all would know in the oscis you don't have the luxury of time so you can't um keep uh, checking it right so the one thing to remember in examinations is that patients there is a patient physically in front of you so they can feel awkward or increase their work of breathing if they just see you staring at the chest and not doing anything so a, key, a sort of a tip is just you once you've checked the heart rate keep your fingers there and just observe their chest this way the patient might think you're still trying to find the uh, pulse rate and measure it but you're actually looking at the respiratory rate 
So once you've uh, inspected the surroundings, had a look at the patient, inspected the hands, you want to move on to inspecting the face. There are three things that you're generally focusing on. General, if there's a general, you're just looking at the face. You're tr trying to see if there's a plethoric complexion. And that's basically if there's a congested red face appearance. If it is, it can be associated with CO2 retention or polycythemia. You're looking at the eyes. You're particularly assessing for any conjunctival pallor. If that is there, that could be indicative of any anemia. And you're looking for any features of Horner syndrome. So that's usually to indicate lung cancer and a particular type of tumor known as Pankos tumor. Uh, can you guys, do you guys remember the features of Horner syndrome? Oh, perfect, yeah. So meiosis, stosis, and anhydrosis. So those are the things you're looking for. Uh, and that might be useful to see in the exam that you're looking for these features. And in, when you're looking at the mouth, there are a few two things that you're mainly focusing on. You're looking for any central cyanosis. Assess the lips, ask them to open the mouth, look at the tongue. Uh, and if there is any cyanosis, that could indicate hypoxemia. You're looking for oral candidasis. That is basically a fungal infection, which is quite common when you use a steroid inhaler. And uh, many a times when you see patients on respiratory wards, they might have a history of COPD asthma and they quite commonly use these inhalers. So you wanna check for these things. So, uh, okay, in, uh, what are we guys assess? What does A show? Conjunctival pallor, that's perfect. So when you're asking someone to check the, uh, to assess for conjunctival pallor, make sure, or tell them either you can ask them to look up and pull down on the eyelids. It's a bit easier if you just tell the patient, can you pull down? Because then you're not sort of invading the person's space and there's something they can do. Yeah, so you can see it's quite light here indicating conjunctival pallor. If it's a nice sort of, um, uh, it's, if it's more red-ish pink, then that would be normal. Okay, what about B? What are we trying? What does B show? Yeah, so that's right. It shows uh, ptosis and meiosis. So meiosis is a constricted pupil, which is a sign of Horner syndrome. So you can see that on the left side of the patient and ptosis is of a lid drop, which can also be seen in comparison to the right eye. Anhydrosis uh, may not always be seen, but yeah, it could. All, uh, but it's a good. But there's always three things to remember in Horner, so it's always good to remember all three. Okay, what about C? Candidasis, yeah. So this is quite like um, an extensive, severe form of oral candidasis. You may just see like a portion of the lung, or you might see that it's quite light. But yeah, this is how bad it can be if someone has oral candidasis. You do see a respiratory patient, always check the medications, always check if there are any steroid inhalers. And finally, what you see in D. Yeah, central cyanosis. So, uh, yeah, uh, so you can see a before and after picture. You can see that it's quite pale and it's blue in comparison to the after picture, which is a nice pink color. Uh, so this makes it easier to sort of see if there's any central cyanosis. Right, so once you've done, uh, all, we've done the hands and you've done the face, you move on to the neck. The three main things you want to assess in the neck, that's the JVP, the jugular venous pressure, the trachea, and you want to assess for any lymphadenopathy. When you're assessing for any JVP, the patient is already lying at 45 degrees and I'm guessing the head would be relaxed on the bed. You want them to look in the left hand side and just tell them to relax and look on the left side. The next step is you want to identify the sternal angle and from there you want to see you measure the height of the JVP. So up to what height um, in centimeters is a rise in the JVP considered healthy or normal? Yeah. So less than four centimeters, that's fine. So when you're, if you see, 
if you see something pulsating but it's less than four centimeters you can disregard it and you can see that's normal but if you see something that's more than four centimeters then yeah you would say this person does have a raised gvp so uh, as i was saying identify the sternal angle imagine a vertical line going from there uh, at four centimeters and look at that level on the neck if that level is more than four centimeters you can say it's uh, you're suspecting a raised JVP. Right. And in terms of the anatomy, you're basically looking between the two heads of the sternocleidomastoid. Right. Once you've assessed the JVP, you want to go on to assessing the trachea. So to do this first, you relax the patient's neck, warn them that this might be uncomfortable but it's going to be quick so it will take you less than 10 seconds to do it then you want to place your index and your ring finger at the medial edge of the clavicle so you guys can even practice it right now very gently and then you want to place your middle finger in the center of your neck such that you should be able to feel the trachea And when you do, when you have uh, put your middle finger in the center, you want to gently apply some pressure and feel the position of the trachea. If you can feel the trachea in the center, it's normal. That's fine. If you feel like it's deviating more to the right or the left, then there's probably some underlying pathology going on. Um, and you would want to comment on that. So I do have a question for you guys. Which of the two conditions results in tracheal deviation away from the affected side? Just pop in the like A, B, C, which are two options you feel. Okay, so a lot of you are saying B, that's correct. B is one of the correct answers. Um, any guesses on what the other one might be? We're getting C in. Okay, fine. Right. So when you're thinking about deviating away from the affected side, there are two things, attention pneumothorax or a pleural effusion. The pleural effusion would have to be a large pleural effusion to actually deviate the trachea away from the affected side. But those are the two common things that should pop into your head. In terms of things that could pull uh, towards the affected side, so a pneumectomy is one of those examples. And if you had a lower collapse, that could also pull towards the affected side. Okay, so we assess the JVP, checked if it's raised. We assess the trachea to see if it's central. Now we're going to assess lymphadenopathy. Uh, so I put it in under neck because of course you're examining the neck. This is something you can do right now or you can do towards the end of the examination when you're in, inspecting the posterior chest because you'll have to tell the patient to sit on the side of the bed. And when you do, it might be comfortable because you don't have to move them twice, um, bring them back on sitting, then lying down and sitting. So to assess the length of the you need to know where you're assessing. So those are the regions that you want to be having a look at. So one is submental, submandibular, parotid, upper cervical, middle, lower, uh, supraclavicular and the posterior triangle. It is useful to remember these names for your OSCEs and to know where exact, what lymph nodes you're exactly having a feel at. In terms of actually the technique of examining, you want to use your index and your middle finger and you locate the area. When you do locate them, you want to move it in a circular motion in that area and you want to assess for any lymphadenopathy. If you don't feel anything, you're just feeling the normal structures or just the skin, that's normal. But if you feel like something's something a bit lumpy, sort of like a circular lump or something, then that's probably um, the lymph node which might be enlarged. And if you do, and that's why you need to know which area because you can say, let's say the parotid lymph nodes are enlarged or the submandibular lymph nodes are enlarged. Now moving on to the last aspect of inspection, which is the thorax. So someone did mention scars earlier. Uh, yeah, and those are the, you basically look at the patient's chest and see if there are any scars. 
the lungs are three D structures, so you want to see if there's any scars on the inter interior chest, anything laterally and posteriorly as well. Uh, so example of some scars. So if it's here on the top left corner, it could be a pacemaker scar. There are other. There's it could be a midline stenotomy scar. Uh, you wouldn't either. Uh, add, um, if you're in phase one, I don't think it's quite essential to remember the names of the scars. But as long as you can identify there's something on the chest, then yeah, you want to go. You want to say that uh, there's a scar. It's, all, it's useful in OSCEs just to ask the patient, what did they have the scar about? And that would probably tell you as much information. The other main thing you're looking for when you're examining the respiratory system are chest wall deformities. So in particular, the three common ones, which are pectus excavatum, pectus carnatum, and a barrel chest. Other things to look for in a thorax, you're just seeing if there's any bruising, any redness or swelling. Uh, yeah, so you, if there's anything abnormal you see, report to the patient. Uh, sorry, report it to the examiner. Okay, so I know we spent a lot of time on inspection, but as you can see, just having a look at the patient, inspecting uh, the hands, the neck, the chest, and the neck can tell you a lot about and uh, what underlying condition is happening. After inspection, you're gonna move on to palpation. And there are two main things you want to do in a respiratory system examination. So you want to locate the apex beads. That's the first thing. And you want to check for chest expansion. So when you're checking for the apex beads, that's how you're going to do it. So you want to lie the fingers horizontally across the chest, as you can see in the picture. And you want to locate the uh, apex beads. That's usually going to be in the fifth intercostal space, midclavicular line. So as you all would, you usually you can identify the sternal angle and lead you to the second space. Keep going down till you identify the fifth intercostal space. And then you come down to the midclavicular line, apply a bit of uh, gentle pressure and try and see if you can feel the apex, uh, apex beat. So which of these is not a cause for a displaced apex beat? Okay, so I think, quite, I think we got a few responses for D, we got a couple for B. Right. The correct answer is D, so cystic fibrosis is not a cause for a displaced apex beat. The others can potentially displace the apex beat, but that doesn't mean they always displace it. So let's say if someone's come in, they have a tension pneumothorax. You may not always find a displaced apex beat, it might be normal but this is something that can be seen. And once you've had a look at the apex B, check if it's displaced or not. You want to move on uh, to chest expansion. So to do this, you basically want, want the patient that you're gonna be placing both hands around their chest, and this may feel a little tight. So as the picture shows, you want to place both your hands around the chest, sorry, and you want to keep your thumbs sort of pointing at each other. And if you are, and if you've kept it tight enough and you've applied good pressure and your thumbs are pointing at each other, when the patient takes a deep breath, you see the thumbs moving away symmetrically, and when the patient again breathes in, they'll come together. Usually, you can try and do it one or two times. Uh, and you can see it symmetrically moving. So in healthy individuals, they should move symmetrically equally on both sides. But in cases where there is a pathology, you'll see reduced expansion. If it's asymmetrical, which would be more commonly observed, you could see that in the case of a pneumothorax, a pleural effusion, if they have uh, infection like pneumonia, or if they have a lung collapse, if it's asymmetrical, then pulmonary fibrosis could be suspected. Okay, so we started with the basics of examination. We inspected the patient. We have palpated appropriately. Now you move on to percussion. 
so when I was in phase one, I often found the technique of actually percussing to be quite challenging. So I'm hoping I can make it easier. The first thing you want to do is you want to place one hand, which is usually your non-dominant one, firmly on the patient's chest. And then you want to, with the middle finger of your other hand, which would be your dominant hand, you want to tap the middle phalanx of the middle finger. So that's how it would look like if you try and uh, percuss. And then you want to compare both sides. So you place your non-dominant hand, use the middle finger of your dominant hand to tap the middle phalanx and compare both sides. The reason you want to compare both sides is because if you just do the left first or the right first, you're not going to remember how the others, um, the exact same place on the other side sounded. So you want to compare both the left right in each area just to make sure that it's uh, the same and there's no pathology going on. If it's a no, uh, if they have normal percussion, no pathology, it's going to sound resonant. So if you try this on yourself, the sound you get would uh, probably indicate normal percussion. Areas to percuss. So you want to start, uh, these are the general areas. You can see that they're color coded. So you want to do the pink with the pink, the yellow with the yellow, and that's to compare and make sure it's the same on both sides. The exception is here. The areas where it's pink is basically you're tapping on the clavicle itself. So you don't need to use your non-dominant hand. You just need to use your dominant hand, the middle finger to percuss directly on the bone and just compare both sides. All the other sides you want to um, all the other sides you want to place your non-dominant hand and percuss and compare all areas. Don't forget to percuss the axilla. It's quite common because you're doing the anterior chest, you do the posterior, but you often forget that lungs are 3D, so you need to percuss the axilla as well. To percuss the axilla, where you guys can see the green dots, just literally go a bit more lateral to that ask the patient to raise the arms, arms and just percuss once and compare it on the other side. Okay, so another question for you guys, which of the following condition results in a hyper-resonant percussion note? Right, okay. So you got quite a few responses in. The answer is E, and I think a couple of you did answer it correctly. Uh, yeah, so with hyper-resonant uh, pneumothorax would be the top uh, differential on your mind. All the others uh, more commonly cause a dull percussion note. And the reason for hyper-resonant is, as you can imagine, in pneumothorax, you've got air that's trapped. So that would probably lead to a hyper-resonant sound. In the others, for example, like fluid effusion, or whether there's a consolidation or a tumor or mass, that would probably reduce the sound. So it would be a duller percussion note. Once you finish percussion, you want to move on to auscultation. So uh, a common thing during phase one is, I. I used to often forget that when you're listening to the lungs, you want to listen to it during both inspiration and expiration. And that's because there could be, uh, for example, a strider is more likely to be an inspiratory thing, a wheeze you more likely hear when the patient's expiring. Now ask the patient to take a deep breath in and out, and that's when you change to the next location. So uh, in terms of the pink places where it's in BB, that's just a supraclavicular, so right above the clavicle, that's where you want to listen with your bell. But all the other areas from yellow to green, you want to listen with the diaphragm of your stethoscope. And as like percussion, it's the same area as percussing. You want to compare both sides and check if there's any abnormalities. Again, don't forget to uh, auscultate the axilla. You can auscultate it with your diaphragm just go a bit lateral to the green dot. Yeah. So I've got a video for you guys, and now we'll talk, and I'm hoping the video will help clarify what the normal lung sounds like and what other um, abnormal sounds like a wheeze or stride there might be.
James, I'm now going to listen to the chest. If you could just take some deep breaths in and out through your mouth. So that's usually how different uh, lung sounds would, like different sounds such as wheeze or strider would sound. The best way to, you know, know if it's a wheeze or strider is just to practice and continue listening to as many chests as you can. And the video is attached to the PowerPoint, so you can always um, have a listen to it. The more you listen, the more your lungs, uh, your ears will become familiar with the sound. Yeah. Uh, and I think a good point Mr. Patacharya made on the chat about percussion um, is when you do place the middle finger on your non-dominant hand, make sure that your non-dominant hand is over the intercostal space and not over the ribs. Uh, so when you're percussing uh, and the, the hyper resonant sound that we saw in tension pneumothorax is usually coming from uh, either the air or the fluid in the pleural space. Okay. Right. Once you've um, auscultated for lung sounds, you can also check for vocal resonance. So why do we assess for vocal resonance? Does anybody have any guesses to that? Okay, that's fine. So usually um, if you have increased tissue density or fluid, that's going to affect the volume at which um, the, pa uh, the patient's speech will be re reciprocated back to us. So that's why you want to assess for vocal resonance. You're basically going to auscultate with the patient saying 99 in the same tone and volume. The sites to auscultate will remain the same as the previous slide, so those don't change. If you do see that there's a decreased volume, uh, when they are saying 99, you can think, is this a pleural effusion? Is there a pneumothorax going on here? If there, are in, if there is an increased volume, you want to think about the opposite to so think if there's any consolidation or any tumor. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so just with vocal resonance, just make sure that the patient says 99 in the same tone, because often patients can, when you keep telling them to say 99, they just keep going um, lower and lower in pitch, and that can affect uh, your examination. Yeah, so as I said previously, we, we, I showed you all of the things in the, in, um, in the anterior chest. Lungs are 3D structures, so make sure you repeat it all posteriorly. The things you're going to be repeating is inspection, palpation. So of course, you're not gonna palpate for the apex beats here, but you wanna do chest expansion you want to do percussion, auscultation, and assess lymph nodes if not done already. When you do, when you start the examination, all the way down to percussing them, um, so auscultating them, the anterior and the lateral chest, they'll be lying down on the bed. Then you can ask them, can you please sit on the side of the bed for me? And when they do, you can finish all the things posteriorly. So that's all of these things. You can do the lymph nodes now, or you, you can do it early in your neck, whichever one you feel is easier. In terms of the actual sites for percussion and auscultation in the posterior chest, so that's where you want to go. You're going to be using your diaphragm for auscultation in all areas. Sometimes people find it because the scapula is usually uh, going to be a scapula is in the back. Sometimes patients find it easier if they ask the patient, can you sort of hug a pillow in the front or cross your arms? That can remove the scapula uh, from your hearing field and then you might be able to listen to the lungs more clearly. Right. So that's essentially the whole examination of a respiratory system. There is a lot, 
but in essence, it's your basics, your inspection, palpation, percussion, auscultation. Once you've done all that, you want to ESPA. When I was in phase one, I used to find it really difficult remembering all the steps. I came up with the mnemonic was IPA. Um, uh, yeah, uh, IPA, and that's just once I've done inspection, I used to just say, okay, where am I ne heading next? In terms of ESPA, you want, so S stands for situation. When you are explaining, you want to say your name, your role, the patient's details, and it should be very brief, about one to three lines about the patient's problem. So if you see a patient, let's say, with shortness of breath, you can say this patient presented with shortness of breath. Background, you want to see if there's any relevant um, medical problems, uh, such as COPD, asthma. Have they been in hospital previously? If they have been a lot in hospital, maybe focus on their last admission, if that's relevant to your history. Moving on to assessment, you want to see, that's when your examination findings will count, see if there's any abnormality noted. And if there's any investigations ordered and you have the results, you can add them in. Recommendation is basically the next steps. This is the point where you can say, I'm concerned that this patient might have an infection. I'm concerned there might be a pneumothorax. What are you gonna do next? If you're in phase one, uh, I suspect they won't uh, ask you to know exactly how to manage them. So you could say, I would raise this up to a senior colleague uh, as this patient requires for the investigation or further management. If you're in phase two, you might need to be more specific and say, uh, the next step would be either to get a chest x-ray or to do bloods and justify why you need to do them. Uh, as someone rightly mentioned, check for the presence of edema. So I do apologize, I didn't include that in the slides, but you can do. Um, I think that's one you even do in cardiovascular. So basically where the patient's ankles are, you just wanna press on them and check if there's any pitting edema. You can also check for any sacral edema right at the bottom of their spine. So right above the buttocks, just say, I'm gonna be pressing on your spine. You can. Um, yeah, uh, for, for smaller things like, uh, check, uh, not smaller, but for things like checking for edema, I would say refer back to university because each one has a uh, sort of a checklist or like things that you must include. Even if let's say you did forget something like edema, you forgot vocal resonance, uh, as long as you did everything properly and you were safe, the examiners are, less, are not likely to fail you because you have done the majority of the things in the right manner and the right technique. Okay, so I thought, no, no one's forced, but I thought we can try to SBAR. So if anyone is brave enough to volunteer to SBAR, and then we can all work together and see what went right and what we can improve. If not, that's fine. I can have a go at S bar. I'll give a minute if someone wants to. You can give it a go. Okay, yeah, that's perfect. Uh, can I ask who's talking? Um, this is Hansa. Oh, okay, yeah. Go ahead, have a go. Okay, so can you hear me now? Um, I'm just waiting for my earphones. Yeah, that's fine. We can hear you. So the situation is that I have been asked to perform a respiratory exam on a female age 63. Um, the background is she's coming in with a two-day history of increased breathlessness. She's been using a blue inhaler for seven to eight, um, seven to eight per day. Yeah, you're doing really well. Go on. Examination. Mm -hmm. It's breathlessness while talking and her chest sounds wheezy and other aspects of her respiratory system examination are unre uh, unremarkable. My recommendation is because since I'm a year one student, um, I will take this up to my seniors. Okay, I can say you did really well. So that's perfect. You said you've been asked to take a respiratory examination in the situation. You can say what you can add is this is a 63 year old lady who has come in with two day history of increased breathlessness. So you can, so like the presenting complaint, you can add that in the situation. 
Um, and then in terms of her background, you can't, yeah, she has a history of asthma. She has been using her inhaler seven to eight times a day without relief. And as you went in for your assessment, that was perfect. You said that she gets breathless while talk, uh, talking. She, her chest sounds wheezy. Uh, everything else is unremarkable. It's important to say that everything else is unremarkable because the other aspects are important. If you haven't done that, the person checking or assessing would be, uh, not in your Ofsky case, but in real life would be like, was that actually done? And then recommendation, yeah. So when you're, you, do, you don't need to say, if you're, because I'm year one, you can say, uh, I would probably, I would just recommend senior help or further investigations, since they would know you're year one. But that was really good, yeah. Uh, that's perfect. So in SBAR, try to keep it short and sweet, about 20 to 30 seconds, ideally, uh, would be the best. Okay, and that is the end of this PowerPoint. Those are the resources I used. So Geeky Medics is quite useful. Macloids um, will give you a bit more sort of, you know, like um, reading around the area if you want to understand why exactly or what exactly. The improvement or NHS document is, that's one that's useful for SBAR. So it sort of gives you examples and works you through it. All images are referenced in this slide. So if you ever want to have a go at them. Uh, yeah, and thank you very much for attending, especially on a Saturday uh, afternoon. I would really appreciate if you guys could fill in a feedback form for me just to see what went well, what we can improve for next time. I will send the link in the group chat. It shouldn't take more than a few minutes. And yeah, the floor is open to any questions. Our next session will be, um, it's a more of a A to E assessment where you'll have one cardiovascular case and one respiratory case. Uh, if you're in phase one, it may feel a bit like strange because you haven't sort of reached that. That's good practice for the future. We do have abdominal examination coming. Um, so I think that would be sometime mid-April. Um, and that is actually delivered by me as well. So I think after the A to E this weekend, you'll have neurological and then you'll have abdominal. But we do plan to go through all the OSCEs examinations by, uh, it might be extended to mid-June, but we're definitely hoping to finish a lot of them by May. <coughs> Sorry. Um, yeah, thank you for attending. Please fill in the feedback. If you have any questions, please go ahead. So I know I think a lot of you are asking about access to the PowerPoint. Um, I believe Beta will either post it publicly or email it. Uh, and you should sort of be informed about that. So don't worry too much. Okay, thank you guys. I'm just gonna finish the meeting.